Secrets and Spies present Espresso Martini. Hello everybody, welcome to our first episode of Espresso Martini, which is a new, I suppose more light-hearted kind of show where myself and author Matt Fulton, we're going to kind of chew the fat about sort of spy stories, geopolitics, terrorism, anything that kind of fits in with the themes of the podcast. So uh, before we get started, um, just in case you're not familiar with who Matt Fulton is, Matt, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Matt Fulton. I am a uh, writer and an indie filmmaker in uh, mm-hmm. New Jersey. I wrote a big spy novel called Active Measures a few years ago um, and have been uh, toiling away on the second in that series for a long yep. time. Um, done a few other projects since then, not all in the um, spy genre, branching out a little bit. Yep. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, flattered that he would ask me to join you. Um, I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, well, it was great to have you on. Um, just in case there are new listeners who have no idea who I am, um, I'm Chris. I'm the producer and uh, host of Secrets and Spies. Uh, the podcast's been running for, what, nearly six years? No, it is six years now. Uh, we passed our 100th episode not long ago. Um, I wrote a spy film, a short spy film called The Dry Cleaner. And the podcast, this podcast, is kind of born out of the research of that short film. And then it kind of just expanded from there. And it sort of turned into very productive procrastination on my part so <laughs> so there we go um so our first topic today we're going to have a look at uh, a few stories there's a few sort of interesting spy stories that matt and i have sort of had a ponder over and we're going to start with the death of queen elizabeth ii so that was obviously quite a big thing in the united kingdom uh, the loss of the queen after 75 years is a huge huge sort of deal and um, so there was a really interesting uh, statement put out by the MI6 chief, Richard Moore, and he paid tribute to the Queen's candour, wit and burning sense of duty. And he also described her as the longest running reader of intelligence reports because the Queen and now the King do get um, access to intelligence reports. They kind of get a briefing and they also meet with the Prime Minister once a week. And during the Queen Elizabeth II's reign, um, she's had 15 chiefs of SIS. And each of them were honoured to oversee the provision of intelligence to the longest reader of intelligence reports. So, yeah, that was a pretty, uh, pretty big thing. And obviously, with James Bond, it's always been on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And now... No more. We are <laughs> His Majesty's Secret Service, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, uh, Matt, what, what were your feelings about the passing of the Queen, kind of from your perspective was there anything that sort of stood out for you or interested you on this uh well i mean sort of unsolicited thoughts from a colonist Mm -hmm. uh you know on the other side of the ocean who's sort of watching this without any real kind of personal attachment to it um i i don't know i mean i i think it's it's obviously it's a huge global story you know one of those once in a lifetime sort of events that very few people alive have seen before and and very few people will see again, you know, I mean, uh, neither of us will see another queen in our lifetimes. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's just one of those things. I mean, she was, she was, how old was she? 96, I believe. Right. Yes. 96. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. So day. it's, 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 you know, it's coming, you know, it's, it's something that's going to happen one day mm. and, and with each year it's sort of like, okay, well, it's probably coming sooner. But then once it happens, it's like, okay, mm. wow. Mm. You know, this is, this is it to see you know, these, these plans that the UK has had in place for 70 years, you know, London Bridge is falling and seeing, you know, when you get the news from Balmoral that she's not well and all the other senior royals are rushing up to Scotland and you see, you know, the BBC reporters all suddenly come in and they're wearing black ties, black clothes, um, just this fine tuned machine that's been rehearsed for years suddenly go into action. Um, it's, it's fascinating to watch. Um, yeah, and sort of what, what Charles's reign, uh, you know, will mean for the future of Britain and, and Mm. the monarchy and the Commonwealth as a whole. I mean, I know you're, you're personally not a monarchist, but I, I believe I saw on, on Twitter that you went up to Buckingham Palace to pay respects for your father. Um, so I would just love to get a sense of what, what, 
you being there experiencing it what 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 that was like yeah it was it was a bit mind blowing um it kind of reminded me there was a few things that sort of happened um first of all the so i went up on friday morning after the news broke so the um so it was thursday night the news broke and friday morning i um yeah i i decided to go there i felt like that i wanted to do something for on behalf of my father because if he was still around he would do the very same thing so i picked some sunflowers which is my dad's favorite mm. flower and uh yeah just got the got the boat to buckingham palace because I, I seem to have got a bit hooked on these uh thames clippers mm. and uh, so i got up and down the thames a lot got the boat and then walked from um westminster and suddenly it was just so many people was the first thing and i think i was lucky because i got there before it got really crazy and i queued for about sort of 90 minutes um and it was just a real interesting mix of sort of people uh sort of locals um some tourists because they had suitcases with them uh, it's not always easy to tell who's a tourist and who yeah. isn't um but uh there was a real sort of yeah just sort of hubbub and it was quite interesting to listen to some people's stories there were a few sort of freelance journalists going around trying to get people's thoughts there was a a lady who um i think just recording her own own thing and just asking people for sort of um yeah just to try and describe why they're there and stuff like that um and the thing that hit me so once i got to the gates of Buckingham Palace, um, I was just hit by the smell of the flowers. Yeah. And it kind of reminded me of a, um, when Princess Diana died, my dad went down to pay his respects. Yeah. And he said one thing that struck him was just the smell of flowers. And instantly, I sort of felt that connection with my dad. My dad passed away in 2019. And it's still, you know, very much... Um, yeah, very much an emotional thing and in my mind. And so I just had a sort of connection with my dad. And I also had a connection with my grandfather too, because my dad would have been 14 when, 13, 14 when the Queen was coronated. And my grandfather obviously was his father. Um, and I never met my grandfather. And it just struck me, it was just such interesting kind of, um, I was able to kind of complete the line of the, the men in the car family during the Queen's reign or something. It kind of just felt this sort of weird family connection. So it became very personal. And I think my memories of the Queen are always around, um, obviously wrapped up around my dad, uh, who really respected the Queen. But we um, every Christmas, we were never allowed to open our presents until after the Queen's speech. So as a kid, like waiting <laughs> till three, four o'clock in the oh, afternoon was, a, a you know, <laughs> like a lifetime. Uh. <laughs> so uh like get on with it liz let's go <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly so i mean like with my own views i've got nothing personally against anybody in the royal family i've just never been as i've got older the more i thought about the idea of royalty it just doesn't really sit well with me because there's a kind of inherent idea of superiority with it right. and and I just, I find that makes me uncomfortable. And from a taxpaying perspective, I would love it if the royal family maybe were a little bit less reliant on the taxpayer and that money went elsewhere into maybe public services and they became more independent, like, um, I can't remember which country it is, but in Scandinavia, they have a royal family who are totally independent of the state, but are still kind of there for ceremonial duties and what have you. So that's kind of where my position is. But uh, the Queen was a, you know, big, important figure in my family life um and it's gonna be sad that she's gone you yeah know, she's been there for a long time so yeah do you do you see do you see the monarchy as an institution persisting i think it will be very difficult for it to go mm -hmm. um i suspect <laughs> this might be a controversial <laughs> opinion but i think by the time king charles is finished mm -hmm that debate might well become more prominent. Yeah. Because when he was Prince Charles, he has been quite divisive in the UK. He's very opinionated about certain things, both good and bad. Just before he became king, there was a scandal involving um, receiving like a million pounds from the Bin Laden family to his charity. Um, so Prince Charles has always been very outspoken. So if he can maintain... Um, like the Queen did her sort of detachment and and sort of um, impartiality, then he'll be fine. But I think if he starts kind of getting into old habits, which die hard, yeah. um, I think there might well be a renewed debate. I think actually the royal family possibly would have benefited from maybe Charles not becoming the king and it goes straight to William yeah. because they're he, Kate and William are younger, yeah. fresh blood, all that stuff. Yeah. But that that you know that's my sort of view on it. So I think constitutionally it'd be very hard to kind of get rid of the royal family. I don't think there's really. I don't think there is an actual desire um, in the UK to get rid of them. I think they're very much, especially with the numbers of people who went out to pay her pay their respects to the Queen. Um, I think the monarchy are going to be around beyond my lifetime. Yeah. I think. 
you know, I could be completely wrong. Maybe next year it all ends. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I think it's, mm. it's, it's, I've thought that too. I mean, again, like I said, unsolicited opinion from a colonist on the other side of the ocean, I think for all the good that Elizabeth has done in her mm. lifetime, you know, mm. and just the fascinating sweep of history that she's reigned over seeing about, you know, the end of the British empire oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah. I think her, her biggest failing is that she raised terrible sons you know on oh a yeah personal level Prince charles andrew, andrew mm. edward seems okay mm. i don't know but if mm. you're if i mean people I, I think whether or not you agree that the monarchy is is an institution that the country should keep i mean i think everyone had some sort of personal affinity to her in some way which Mm. helps people keep okay yeah let's let's keep this going that taxpayer burden that you mm. mentioned you're it's, it's easier to bear <laughs> yeah. but if you're mm. you know if you don't personally like your king it's it's a lot easier to say mm. okay well let's let's do something else and that's gonna be hard you know but i mean you're also coming up on yeah a thousand years since william the conqueror you know mm. so yeah <laughs> Yeah, it will be interesting to see, especially the way um, with sort of the progressive debates and things like that about that are sort of challenging some of the societal norms that we've kind of maybe got a bit too used to and some of our traditions that are based in potentially the suffering of other people. Yeah. It will be interesting to see where that debate will go with the monarchy and what it actually comes to. And I think you're, I, you know, I agree with your observation about her sons. I just, Prince Andrew in particular, besides that dreadful sex scandal that he may or may not be involved mm -hmm. with, he, I remember reading a book years ago from a royal protection officer and just the way he described the way Andrew would just treat them with total disdain was just, I thought, appalling. Considering those officers would willingly put their life on the line yeah. for this guy, um, you know, he he would just treat them absolutely badly, yeah. and I just think that's really not cool. And he, even there's even been stories of um, Prince Charles dismissing some of his staff right in the middle of the one of the ceremonies, memorialising the Queen. Yeah, there's a deep insensitivity and a sense of entitlement that seems to kind of come through with um, with uh, Andrew and potentially King Charles. Um, and I just don't like it personally, and that's that's, and it doesn't help their case at no, all. No, not at all. I think if they'd skip Charles, moved on to the next generation, yeah. I think maybe, maybe the they the monarchy might be more popular. But I don't know. Who am I? Who am I to? I'm not the definitive authority on. We'll the monarchy, see. So. Watch this space. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So let's move on to some good old fashioned espionage. Um, so there's been a really great story that actually broke in August. I was on holiday at the time in Italy when I first saw this. And it's all about a sort of Russian spy at NATO, and it was reported by Bellingcat. So the GRU apparently had an agent who charmed her way into NATO circles in Italy. In 2018, open source investigative journalist Bellingcat exposed poor tradecraft by the GRU. The GRU had furnished their spies with consecutively numbered passports. So if you got that information, it would be very easy to find a GRU agent which is how Bellingcat have suddenly managed to track a lot of agents um, from the Scripple poisoning to all other things too. So this this revelation sent shockwaves through the GRU because the Bellingcat made it public. I must admit, I wonder why they did that, because I would have thought from an intelligence point of view that would be handy to keep that quiet, but <laughs> they are journalists, not spies. So, you know, um, it's my inner inner C there. But, um, so then um, the head of the illegals program at the GIU contacted all their agents abroad, and they were all rushed rush back to Russia at different times to get new passports. And Bellingcat learned the identity of this one illegal, Maria Adela Kufelt Riviera. Trust it have a very long and complex name there. But anyway. <laughs> very classic Femme Fatale spy name there. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I know, it's always the Femme Fatale. It's like Anna Chapman, bless yeah. her, you know. Um, yeah, they always get the attention when there's usually sort of far more capable spies who people don't talk about but also got arrested at right. the same time. right. <laughs> Um, and so Maria had been around for about a decade and she had been sort of traveled the world as a cosmopolitan uh, Peru born socialite was sort of her cover and she had her own jewelry line. So I'm assuming maybe selling jewelry to people to the wives of NATO officials or something was probably her in. And then obviously she made friends with people working at NATO in Naples. So yeah, this case is quite similar to Anna Chapman. Um, this sleeper technique is almost exclusively Russian. Western intelligence officers I've spoken with have said that it's it's um, 
pretty much near impossible to convince someone from the West to move to Russia uh, uh, in an undercover identity. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's very hard to sell to say, hey, you're going to go to Moscow and pretend to be a school teacher for the next 40 years. Um, and what was interesting as well, so this is with this illegal operation, um, I believe Maria's identity is a cover identity, but with Anna Chapman, she used her real identity. And I think that's becoming slightly more common. It's sort of Russian spies who have sort of plausible reasons to be in the target country and sort of work their way up the social ladder. So, um, Matt, I don't know if there's anything you stood out for you in this case. I think this is a fascinating story. I read through this article mm. a couple of times. I mean, I mean, one Bellingcat just does incredible work. Um, like they you're, do. you're, you're, you're reading through this and seeing how they pull the threads and piece this stuff together yeah. with leaked metadata and, you know, just, just trawling social mm. media for what mm. must be, mm. I mean, hundreds of man hours. Um, yeah. Fascinating story. Um, it, it, it reads to me, you know, you, you read stories about these illegals programs and like your points about Anna Chapman, this sort of more common trend to use their, their, their real names. These legends, mm. you know, like these spy mm. cover identities are so hard to build in the modern digital age, you know, where everyone has, mm. almost everyone has social media profiles, you know, yep. digital footprints yep. stretching back years or decades, you know, and, and, and to build that behind these fake cover identities, it, it's so difficult to pull off authentically, you know? Um, yeah, looking through like the lengths that the GRE went through to to put this together, really fascinating. You know, it reminds me of like uh, which Frederick Forsyth novel it was, but uh, oh, Day of the Jackal, Day of the Jackal, yeah, where he yeah. would go to the graveyards and see, you know, like a child yeah. who died in infancy, and then build an identity based yeah. on that. Um, you know, you think all this work that they go through for this woman, who honestly did not seem to be that effective at her job. Um, I mean, lived a very nice, glamorous life outside of Russia. Um, but all of this just to get close to people at NATO's uh, Allied Joint Force Command in, in Naples to hear, you know, possibly bits of information about naval operations in the Mediterranean, the North Sea and the Baltics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really, really kind of fascinating the lengths that they go to to achieve not that much success. Yeah. Yeah, it seems very high effort with very low results, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Um, when a regular intelligence officer or somebody without official cover, um, is it non-official cover? So somebody on the not yeah. list, um, if they were just sent in on a plane, I'm sure they could probably do just as good a job to an extent. But maybe the sleepers sort of um, sow the seeds for a bigger operation. Because I think like with the scripple poisoning, the one thing that's always bothered me is who did the planning, who did the surveillance of Scripple to get kind of his... Right um his habits his patterns to build up this profile that you give to set assassins who fly over the day before read the document and go oh okay it's yeah. 6 a.m we're gonna poison his door yeah um that that i i've never seen a really good um explanation of who did that planning um and that that's the bit that sort of keeps me awake sometimes <laughs> those kind of things what i would guess i mean there's there's two options there the sort of mm. uh the one that will help you sleep better at night is their, uh, you know, Russian diplomats under official cover at the embassy in London. The one that will help you not sleep yeah. so well at night is they were British nationals working for the Russians. Well, I think that might be more likely because the problem about the Russian diplomats, there probably is MI5 surveillance. I've certainly read yeah. um, there's a book years ago that um, had a, an incident in... Um, it's a place in Surrey called Farnborough, and it's where British um, yes. BAE Systems. I can't remember what BAE stands for now, but BAE Systems who developed lots of high tech weapons from the you know from the Typhoon fighter back in the yeah. day and so on. They're based there, and there's an awful lot of Russian activity around there. And certainly, when I went to the Farnborough Air Show, I, I had fun spotting diplomatic plates for Libyans and various sure. other nationalities. Sure. Um, so you know, diplomatic plates. Once you know what they look like, it's quite a fun hobby sometimes. Yeah. Um, I don't know, in the UK, um, sorry, so diverting slightly, but there'll be a point. In the UK, they usually have a three-digit number and then the letter D no. at the beginning of the registration, and that's how you know it's a diplomatic uh, plate. So I think um, the uh, agents of diplomatic cover would probably have to try and use cutouts to do all that sort of stuff, because also it'd be hard for them to spend the amount of days following Scripple. 
because they would have had to i i don't i mean i've never been an assassin so i don't <laughs> know neither. what the, how, <laughs> the no, real so i don't know if it takes yeah <laughs> it's like does it take two or three weeks to do surveillance is that enough or do you spend a month i don't know how long do you spend following someone to get an idea of their patterns i don't know. i think you would spend I, I think you would spend a good amount of time you know you would really want to work up a pattern of of that person's yeah. daily activity you wouldn't yeah, want to be surprised yeah. by anything when you press go yeah. in that kind of an operation and how did they find him i mean like um you probably heard my story about oleg gordievsky who used to live in my hometown he was a former kgb agent so he lived in a similar situation to scripple and so obviously these russian agents who've defected end up in small towns in the uk somewhere yeah. but it's not like it's not easy you can't look them up in the phone book or on google yeah. so um i mean oleg went public about his location many years ago um so I'm not sort of revealing anything by saying it was my hometown. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's not easy to find out information. Scripple relatively kept himself relatively quiet. And I think the only thing he was doing prior to his the assassination attempt was briefing um, sort of NATO members and members of the Five Eyes community on Russian espionage techniques and the Russian mafia. Yeah. Um, so does that point to... Um, a mole? I don't know. It, there's there's all sorts of ways that could go. Really. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> get George Smiley on it. Yeah, fascinating how this stuff works. It is. It is. So um, uh, this probably segues nicely into uh, Russia's newest citizen. <laughs> God bless Edward him. Snowden, former <laughs> NSA contractor, and uh, I put supposed whistleblower. Uh, some people he is a whistleblower. Some people he's a traitor, stroke defector. Uh, certainly many former. Uh, intelligence people I've spoken to yeah. don't have particularly positive views of Snowden. Not a fan. Yeah, and me neither. And and like suppose you know, apparently the information he left um, the US with, the stuff that we know about is only the tip of the iceberg, the amount of data he took. And he yeah. went to China first. So I've always for me, my spy hat went on um the second he went to Hong Kong because you know, China is a, a near competitor to the US. It's like flying into Moscow. Right. It just strikes me as a bit weird. There were other countries non extradition, like Switzerland, he could have gone to. He, I don't know about now, Iceland is a place that was f um, very popular with hacktivists and all those kind of things. So I'm not sure on the whole whether going to Iceland would have led to extradition or not. Certainly, Iceland had um, previously had cover from the US Air Force for protection in the Cold War. So I'm not sure on that. But Iceland certainly struck me as a place ideologically. Logically, you would want to go to if you're a hacktivist yeah. um, and of Snowden's sort of like um, supposed uh, political views. But instead, he's ended up in a country with um, an intelligence services that has far less regulations governing how it spies on its citizens and how it treats people. And at the moment, his now new home country is involved in a horrific war in Ukraine, doing all sorts of dreadful things. We're seeing things about mass killings. And I've not seen a peep from Snowden that denounces this war I, and in fact the only thing he did do well first of all he was mocking people who were commenting on the russian troop build up just prior to the yeah. war he was actively mocking people and even the day before the war he was at his peak with that and then he went silent for days then he did post something about oh well uh i'm not hanging from a um a hook or anything but uh i can't remember what he said after he's just something like but maybe i was wrong or something and that was it and then it went quiet again just disappeared yeah for months yeah yeah and then slowly his more recent stuff just been critical of america again sort of providing propaganda for putin and so on so um yeah i, I don't know what your views on snowden are but I, i've never s understood why he's viewed as a hero um by people on the sort of far left and maybe the the far right it always strikes me as a bit odd <laughs> my 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 views on snowden are in line with you i mean i'm mm. my personal political affiliations are more left of center as i believe mm. yours are but i mean i'm no i'm yeah. no fan of 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 him and what he did i mean are there can 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 you have a sensible conversation about abuses of power of the nsa you know should a government agency have that much insight into the everyday lives of of people i mean i, I think you can you can have a, a, a sensible debate about that mm. um and i i definitely see that at times i mean i think personally mm. the average mm. person unless you're tied up with a drug cartel or a foreign intelligence organization or a terrorist group the nsa does not care about you and the nsa <laughs> has much bigger concerns what you should be concerned about is google and amazon and 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 facebook oh yeah i agree something that is vastly more intrusive into your life yeah. and arguably knows 
Mark Zuckerberg knows way more about you than mm. the head of the NSA. I mean, just 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 flat out. Yeah. And this is stuff that you yeah. willingly give to these companies, you know. Um, so, I mean, is there is uh, but for me, it's it's how Snowden went about it and that, you know, yeah, he he mm. landed mm. in Russia. I mean, it seems to me as far as the Ukraine invasion that he he earnestly did not believe that it was going to happen. And did seem mm. genuinely shocked when it did, as I think most people did. I mean, it seems like the average mm. Russian military officer did not know that this was going to happen. Mm. Um, mm. Especially the uh, the guys who were there for like three or four months on the board. Yeah, right. Like, oh, yeah, we're told that we're going to go over for training for a couple of days. And then, you know, oh, we're, we're getting the car and we start driving and then we're in Ukraine and we're being shot yeah. at. And we have no idea what's happening, yeah. you know? And and during a dreadfully cold winter as well, so they were right. there on the border for months, even over Christmas, and they can't see their families. Yeah. I mean, the morale must have been really through the through the floor by that point. <laughs> right. Him becoming a Russian citizen, I'm not surprised by this. I sort of quipped yeah. on Twitter when I saw this. I was like, okay, now give him a rusty AK and ship him off to the front. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I think I saw that he uh, he he got a he got a pass from being mobilized, which you know also not surprised, but. Uh, I don't know. They can have him. I mean, I think I forget who said it, but one of those things is like one of the biggest deterrences for Westerners from spying for Russia is that you didn't have to live in Russia. Yeah. So, yeah. Good luck, bud. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. It's like the old saying that people who romanticize Russia have never been to Russia. You know, and you get these sort of figures on the uh, on the sort of far left now who still have this rosy eyed view of communist Russia and uh and somehow still managed to like Vladimir Putin. Putin's always a fascinating figure to me because he somehow manages to please the far right and the far left. Well, that's horseshoe theory. Yeah, I mean, feel free to tell us a bit about it. Well, yeah, it's 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 this it's this belief that the extremes on on either ends of the political spectrum, both far right and far mm. left, wrote back around at their extremes into the sort of same yeah. point of insanity. You know, like that's where you have tankies for lack of a better term, you know, mm, people on yeah. the far left who are basically just anti-American, anti-Western, that will have this sort of oppositional defiance disorder in their heads to whatever the West does. Therefore, you know, okay, you have this genocidal dictator in mm, Putin or mm. Bashar al-Assad that, you know, mm. as long as they're opposed to the West, they're somehow okay and they'll apologize for it. Yeah. You know, the same thing on the right, which basically... I mean, they see Putin as this, you know, masculine defender of traditional values and Christianity mm. against, mm. you know, gender liberties and and Islamists that are sort of infiltrating yeah. the West. And it ropes back around yeah. until they both sort of see this as as something that they can look up to and 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 sympathize with. And it's really yeah. kind of nuts. No, it is. It is. And it's sort of like and there's been accusations that you know, the Russian government of directly financed sort of far right parties in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I've not seen much on far left, but it wouldn't surprise me. It's so. definitely there. I mean, there's <laughs> no. a story. It mm. wasn't in our outline, but there's a story that broke not too long ago um, here about how uh, Russian troll farms sort of influenced uh, the Women's March, you know, in, 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 oh. in 2017, 2018. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think. All in all, these up. We should talk about this on a later pod. But uh, yeah, um, oh, I spent yeah. two hundred yeah. million dollars influencing these, you know, domestic political movements, and you know what they've gotten for that. Their return on investment. If you look in, you know, both of our countries with Brexit, with Trump, I mean, yeah. they they yeah. definitely got what they paid for. Then some. You know, those operations yeah. are a lot more effective than whatever they were doing in Naples. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well. There's a center-left U.S. political commentator called Bob Seska, who I follow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you follow Bob, but um, he did a really great tweet where he said, Putin's had a busy 10 years. Snowden, 2013. Invasion Crimea, 2014. Trump, 2015 to the present. Western social media, 2015 to the present. Brexit, 2016. He probably should add Scottish independence, which failed, but it might happen again. Um, Le Pen, 2017 and 2022, which were both unsuccessful. And then the invasion of Ukraine, and the jury's still out whether yeah. it's successful or not. So so let's hope it's not. But um, I think one of the things about with the invasion of Ukraine, I think Putin made the classic error that a lot of people make, especially with businesses and daily life. 
they put way too much um, stock into what so how social media kind of translates into reality. I think that um, I think Putin maybe had been looking at Facebook and Twitter too much and their successes there and thought, oh, now the West is finally divided. Yeah. NATO's, you know, FC UK, as I call it, you know, NATO is going to be, you know, all over the place. Let Now's the time to do it. And it didn't work out. No. So um, I wonder, I don't know, I, there's a brilliant Hitler um, video from Downfall. <laughs> where <a> great movie. <laughs> it's basically <laughs> Putin, you know, really pissed yeah. off. I love it. I love those Downfall <laughs> videos. I still, I've still yet to watch Downfall, and I won't ever be able to see that scene the same way. Oh, it's a great movie. You got to watch it. You got to watch it. It's so good. I mean, apart from the memes, it's a great film. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. So uh, I kind of like this image of Putin banging his desk and getting annoyed with bloody social media, you know, because mm-hmm. <laughs> social media, if anybody who uses it for business, is a real mixed bag and takes an awful lot of effort. And the big debate in social media, all the gurus I've spoken to over the years, is always every conference you go to at a social media, there's always some talk about return on investment. Yeah. <laughs> Just um, sometimes it takes an awful lot of effort to get something back on social yeah. media so uh, i think the moral of the story is it's best not to take it too seriously and it doesn't necessarily reflect reality but uh, but there we go talking about defectors um well not defectors talk about russian spies who uh, were former uh, government employees ronald palton who was a convicted spy for the soviets has died at the age of 80 um pelton's motivation was money um he was broke when he first approached the soviets and then made thirty five thousand dollars selling u.s government secrets and he was convicted on all charges except one count of espionage and was sentenced to three life sentences plus an additional 10 years now not quite sure how he ended up being um ending up in a nursing home if he's been convicted for all that but i'm assuming when your health deteriorates at a certain point maybe the u.s government say okay you can go to a, a nursing home now um and uh and live out your final day. So Ronald Pelson passed away in a nursing home. I don't know if you have any thoughts on Ronald Pelson. Uh, it's an interesting case, especially in the light of uh, Snowden getting his Russian citizenship. <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of those uh, classic instances of, uh, they say, for your motivations to spy, mm-hmm. it's mice. What is that? Mm-hmm. Money, uh, ideology, coercion, and ego. That's it. That's you know, it. so this is an instance of... Uh, you know, who a guy who clearly had big financial difficulties. I think this article talks mm. about at one point when he approached the Soviet embassy, he had only a couple hundred dollars in his bank account. Um, and you know, had all these access to NSA secrets and said, mm. Hey, I'll do it mm. for and you got what, thirty five thousand dollars? Um, not yeah. that much in the grand scheme of things. Um No, I suppose in old money it was a bit more, but yeah. I don't know what thirty five thousand dollars back in the eighties translates to for now, multiple but it's still life sentences, yeah. Money. Um, yeah, no, no, I'd want millions. Yeah. For me, I think my price is five million yeah. upwards, really. Uh, yeah, no, very, very classic case of a yeah. guy down on yeah. on his luck financially who uh, got uh, got tied up with the Russians and got and got bid for it. But, you know, I mean, if I'm going to be honest, I don't, this guy's a traitor. I don't condone what he did, but I have more mm-hmm. respect for him than I do for Snowden, you know, who yeah. will, yeah, who indeed. will clearly deny the obvious of what he is and what he's doing and then cloak himself in a messiah complex whereas ronald pelton where it's like yeah i was broke i needed money and i had access to government secrets and mm. i sold it to the russians like i don't agree with it but i understand <laughs> you know yeah not too dissimilar to aldrich ames but he he gave away much more damaging secrets yeah. and made a lot more money and and um supposedly was trying to keep up with the uh, expensive taste of his wife yeah. um and his own ego yeah <laughs> so uh yeah there's um yeah it's a very interesting sort of story the Aldrich yeah. James ones but I don't think uh, Pelton was quite as damaging as, as Aldrich James yeah. um but uh, no and it's um so it's the 75th anniversary of the CIA um and as part of their celebrations they opened up their refurbished museum to journalists my question is where the hell was my invite because i would love to visit the cia <laughs> museum too. and particularly the cia starbucks i mean this is the uh peak um what's it called pumpkin spice latte season i'd be nothing would make me happier than having a pumpkin spice latte at the cia headquarters so if anybody at the cia is listening to this i don't think that's a huge request but i wouldn't mind it call us up <laughs> call us up sitting there lovely yeah. courtyard with a pumpkin spice latte i would do it this museum looks looks fascinating. Um, like it talks you through yeah. the uh, 
a lot of their most famous operations, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, Bin Laden raid, the uh, Glomar Explorer operation to yes. lift the Soviet oh, submarine off the ocean with yep. Howard Hughes's help. Yep. Um, it's about the Argo operation to uh, get the uh, American diplomats who are trapped in Tehran after the revolution. That's it. Yeah. Um, and they even, it was really surprised me. They had a model of the building that I'm in also Wakri was, was in when, yeah. uh, last month, uh, the CIA assassinated. Yeah, fresh off the fresh press. Fresh off the one. press. Yeah. Just declassified <laughs> it said. Um, yeah. yeah, no, really fascinating museum. Um, have you gotten a chance to check out the spy museum in DC? I've not been. I, so the closest I've been, there was an exhibition in New York in 2016 where they had some, mm -hmm. um, they were exhibiting some items. So I've seen the ax that killed Trotsky. I've seen Anna Chapman's laptop. I've seen the, um, the mural that the Russians bugged and put in the American embassy in Russia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, I've seen the handcuffs that the, the 10 spies who were arrested with Anna Chapman were wearing. Uh, what else have I seen? So I've seen bits of, Piece, but I've not yet to been to the mothership in DC, and obviously it's just recently got a new building. I did get so, uh, <laughs> oh god, a contact. Uh, so uh, a sort of friend of the podcast, former guest, dropped me an email. I said, "Oh, Chris, I'm going to a cocktail party at the uh, Spy Museum, um, but it's on tomorrow." And I'm like, "I'm in fucking London. I'm not. I'm not in. Like, I'm not in DC." Fire up your jet. And um, <laughs> I know it's like God. The budget of this podcast is not that big. I wish it were. I mean, you know, <laughs> get my jet and fly yeah. out there. And I was really like, oh my goodness, I'd love to go because it seemed to be like the who's who of sort of former spy, former CIA spies were at this this event, and um, <laughs> I felt really left out. So it was like I would have loved to have gone. There. Yeah. So uh, I, somebody give me an invite with a bit more time, and I'll definitely go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I used to. Have you I've, been? I've been. been several times. I haven't been. So they moved. I think it was only a year or two ago that they moved to a new place yeah. by Lafayette Square. Um, I I haven't been since they've moved. But their old location, which was uh, sort of near Gallery Place, Chinatown, if listeners are familiar with the geography of DC, it's sort of in downtown. Um, been there a bunch. Uh, I used to 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 live in DC and would go often to their bookstore, the gift shop, which you could just go yeah. into. Um, and, and the stuff they had on their shelves was just like, for me, you know, like a huge Tom Clancy, James Bond, James Bond, John le Carré fan, um, you know, and, and researching and writing, uh, a spy novel myself was just fascinating. Some of the books they have there, there's a huge bookshelf behind me. And a lot of this stuff is, uh, is, uh, from their, from their gift shop. Um, oh, brilliant. so yeah, definitely got to get back down there and check out mm. the new, the new building, but. Mm. Yeah, well, I'll keep you posted because I, I definitely want to do a DC trip. Um, yeah, tell me. I really want to go. Uh, yeah, and I really want to do the FBI tour as well. Because have they reopened the FBI building? I probably not yet. Hoping next year or something. I'm not okay. sure. That would have you'd have to check that. I'm hoping next year we're way past COVID. Fingers crossed, yeah. and it will reopen. But um, I just because of the X Files, I'm so like the build the FBI building is just such a like this building that's in my subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to just go into just one. It's a very it's a very <laughs> big sort of creepy place that just like yeah. looms over the yeah. street. Yeah. 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 It's not a particularly attractive no. building, but it's just to me very iconic because of the X Files. And in fact, what I would do, probably get told off to do this but i'd try and find the exact spot where they would do there was always a shot in the x files they did like a, a tilting down to the fbi building and it was always this angle in virtually every other episode a bit like friends where they had a tilt up right. to an apartment or something you know and it's just like it's very nerdy but i just love it <laughs> so i'd be very happy going there yeah. um now uh there was an article about writing about uncertainty so a former cia officer who used to write for the president's daily brief has given some writing tips on medium about how to write about uncertainty in official documentation so there'll be a link to that article and all the articles we talked about today in the show notes uh matt as a writer have you had a quick look through and anything stood out for you i had a quick scan um yeah it's 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 interesting. I they, they have a chart in there that basically sort of breaks down when they they when you're writing the PDB. So it's like the CIA judges, yeah. like the famous example of um the article in the PDB right before 9-11, I think it was called Bin Laden Determined to Attack United States, you know? So it basically the CIA says we judge with high confidence, you know, that Bin Laden or mm. Al Qaeda is likely to do this in the next X amount of months. So there's a chart that breaks down high confidence or confidence, low confidence, et cetera. 
and sort of matches that up to with how likely are the percentages that they feel that this is to happen. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see, you know, how, what weight the intelligence community puts on writing clearly for their customers, the policymakers sort of get across, you know, how do you feel, how, how much weight are you going to put behind your intelligence, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, sort of interesting. And for yeah. me, you know, in, in active measures and in the rest of the series, I've written a couple quote unquote, fake PDB articles. So having that sort of language there. Um, yeah, handy is, is, is interesting. Definitely. One thing it did stand out for me because he did a Twitter thread, um, using examples of Star Trek and Star Wars, but there was one point that did stand out about not using percentages or statistics unless there's actually been proper statistical analysis. Yeah. So if you say off the top of your head, well, I think it's 50, 50, obviously we do this all the time, but in an official document, it's not a good idea to say it's 50, 50 or 20% or whatever, unless you have some proper analysis that backs all that yeah, up. Yeah. That was, that was funny how they used the Star Trek and Star Wars, uh, analogies yeah. like you can't really go to the jedi council and it's 50 50 yeah. that the chancellor is a sith lord like what mm. do you do with that that's it you know <laughs> <laughs> spoilers for star wars it. people <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that was aaron berman he was a former cia analyst and he's um on medium so it's medium.com forward slash at aaron a-a-r-o-n Beeman, B-M-A-N, and his name's actually Aaron Berman, and he's abbreviated it. And he's also on Twitter at Aaron Beeman. So uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. But it's a good one, I think, for spy writers. That'd be very useful. Yeah. Um, and for anybody who professionally has to write about uncertainty, I'm sure that'd be handy in a business uh, sense as well. So uh, we'll move into nuclear threats because well, I, <laughs> I think stop. all of us... Oh my goodness! I mean, we, we've had COVID. Um, what do we have before COVID? I've lost track. We, well, we sort of, depending on how you look at it, we had the era of Donald Trump. So, for some people that was great. Some people that was not so great. <laughs> then we've had COVID, <laughs> which we've has not been awesome. Brexit. And oh, we've had Brexit, revolving yep. door of BMs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the pound has fallen just recently. Yes, that's the yeah. new Gerald Butler film. The pound has fallen, and uh, joking, obviously, but uh, probably will be. Um, and now we, you know, we're facing. We've been facing since uh, the invasion of Ukraine or the war on Ukraine. Um, a nuclear threat. Putin has sort of, you know, he's been sort of uh, rattling the nuclear saber for some time, which is throwing a few people on the far left into big question marks because for a while they've for some reason delude themselves in thinking that Putin's somehow less aggressive than the West and less imperialistic than the West, but I don't think he is. I think he might be worse. And probably if I were to put a statistic on who was going to use a nuclear weapon, at the moment I think Putin is more likely than um, President Biden. I, I couldn't say about President Trump or former President Trump. I know he was a bit of a... He was fascinated by I I was reading some about Trump that surprised me the other day that he was quite fascinated and scared of nuclear holocaust, which is totally understandable. So he may have actually been less likely to use a nuclear weapon. He certainly didn't manage to do it during his presidency, which I was quite grateful for because it was a time when North Korea was heating up and we thought, uh-oh. Um, so <laughs> thank you for Donald Trump for not nuking North Korea um, or not. I don't know. That might pan out a few years later as a bad <laughs> idea, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the interesting things is Russia does have a first strike doctrine with regards to nuclear weapons, and they actively train around that doctrine on military exercises, whilst in contrast, the US, since the Obama administration, and I don't think this has changed, there's now a no first use policy in place, because before America were willing to launch a nuclear attack against Russia um, and be the people to do it. Um, and then with regards to the war in Ukraine, I've always seen this as the most serious nuclear threat to the world since the Cuban Missile Crisis and Able Archer, the NATO exercise in 1983, that freaked out the Russians and made them think it was a prelude to invasion. Not too dissimilar to how Russia invaded Ukraine. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, Matt, are there any thoughts on this article uh, about... Yeah. I think it's a concern. I, I think this, this is a Washington Post article we're talking about right now. Yes. Um, it, 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 it does a good job of sort of laying out the different scenarios of how nuclear weapons could come into use. Um, I think, you know, what the author said was a small tactical use, like a battlefield nuclear weapon is probably the most likely. I still don't, like, I don't walk around my day-to-day -day life worried that there's going to be mm. nuclear war or that we're going to see mm. nuclear weapons used. Mm. Um, in Ukraine, but it's, it's a, 
it, it, it's a real concern. I mean, to, to your point that Russia has first use of nuclear weapons written into its military doctrine. I mean, yeah, that's it. That's that's they constantly train for that, you know, in all their exercises. A lot of it is they have a small nuclear weapon that that's that goes off that they deploy, um, you know, in, in the. Cold War, uh, they developed a lot of these small tactical use, you know, one kiloton yield nuclear weapons that could be carried around by a Spetsnaz team that could be used for sabotage to block, you know, the port of Hamburg or the Kiel Canal mm. or to mm. take out NATO's military headquarters in Mons, Belgium, um, stuff like that. The suitcase nuke was the plot of many a 90s film. Yeah. Um, I think it was the Peacemaker. Peacemaker think, was one it? of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a real thing, you know, and I think mm. the more it becomes apparent to Putin and his inner circle and the propagandists on Russian state TV that Ukraine is failing, you know, that this quote unquote partial mobilization is not going to work. I think Mm. especially if the Ukrainians are able to credibly threaten Crimea, which to me, like I've always said to people, I think that's going to be the end stages of the war is that the Ukrainians can credibly threaten mm. Crimea. That's mm. when it's going to get mm. real. That's when it's going to get interesting. Mm. Um, mm. I think as you get to those end stages, it, it's it's more of a threat that that you do see something of that caliber, you know, whether it's not mm. just a nuclear weapon deployed and exploited on the battlefield or, you know, something really dumb and unfortunate happens at that Zaporizhia nuclear plant, you know, the largest nuclear power yeah. plant in Europe. Um, which would be a whole lot more devastating if that thing goes up than a one or 10 kiloton nuclear weapon being deployed. Mm. I think the good, the good thing here, if there's good news that we're talking about here, mm. it's, it's very easy for Western intelligence to sort of see when these weapons start coming into play. Um, in the, so we have the Russia's strategic rocket forces, which control the ICBMs and stuff, uh, they just control the ICBMs, you know, like the rockets that send these things up. The warheads in the Cold War were controlled by a detachment from the KGB. And now I believe that's part of the GRU that it's under. So you have these clear chains of control that the Russians have established that it's very easy for us, even through technical intelligence means, not just human sources on the ground, to sort of see that these things are coming into play. And I think if those conversations do start happening in the Kremlin or in the Russian general staff, we'll know. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of, uh, strategic di- disclosures of intelligence as we saw, uh, in the early days of the lead up to the invasion of Ukraine that like, we know what you're doing and you should probably stop. Yeah. They've been quite good on that. Actually, it's been very interesting. Yeah. And I've, I, I'm a bit of a, an aviation enthusiast. So I have this app called flight radar 24. So I've been nerdish, nerdishly if that's a word, watching um, aircraft activity day to day over Ukraine. There's this drone that goes up every day um, and its um, handle is 40 F-O-R-T-E, either 11 or 12. There's been a few nuke sniffer planes. There's a lot of tankers refueling yep. aircraft. Um, and then the uh, one of my favorites, the rivet joint, has been flying around, scooping up electronic data almost on a daily basis. And actually, that was going on even last summer. 40, 11, and 12, that drone that flies from Italy, I think it is, that, that's that been floating around the Black Sea for some time now. Um, you know, every other day there's some sort of uh, activity going on. So, yeah, I think the use of intelligence and then kind of openly warning um, has been quite effective. The only thing that gave me pause, um, so with the west sort of arming ukraine we're kind of in a situation a bit like afghanistan of the 80s uh with the funding of the uh, mujahideen yeah. and i'm not comparing the ukraine to the mujahideen they're very different but the principle of giving weapons to an opposition to russia there's sort of this sort of weird little line where it's got to be some plausible sort of deniability because uh, there will come a point where russia might turn around and say, you know, one more Western weapon is used, that's it, it's a declaration of war. So it's this sort of tipping point you want to avoid. Yeah. And I, I was quite disappointed by the British MOD put out this video um, showing the British Army training Ukrainian soldiers of AK-47s in Britain. And I thought that was just a step too far, uh, personally, in the media campaign. I think those are sort of things that you kind of keep on the QT. Quite brazen. For very good reasons. Quite brazen. Yeah, I mean, just um, the... just. 
the extent to our support that we're giving Ukraine. You know, not, mm. not just the UK and the US, but countries like like Germany too, you know, to see the amount of equipment, the type of equipment that they're willing to openly give uh, the Ukraine. You know, I saw a picture yesterday, I think it was a, a cargo ship being loaded up with 18 more high Mars missile systems that are being sent to Ukraine. I mean, that's not secret at all. It's saying like, yeah, we are every day shipping billions of dollars worth of arms that are directly killing Russian troops on the ground and we're doing it. And what are you going to do about it? And thus far, the answer is Russians aren't doing anything about it to us. No. You know, I mean, yeah, there's your, your energy bills in Europe, you know, that's sort mm. of their response at this point. Um, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky situation. It is. I'm glad I'm not a diplomat because it's quite complicated. <laughs> I don't know quite how you navigate this one. And, um, cause we all want to, I think everybody wants to avoid World War Three. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a debate of whether we're actually in it and just have decided not to say it. Um, but, uh, yeah, cause there's all sorts of things seem to be kicking off internationally at the moment. Um, but it's, it is definitely a, yeah, it's just a line you've got to be careful you don't cross. And this is why I was trying to explain to a friend of mine why you can't just make Ukraine NATO now, because I think that would be a line that would be, you know, be a line too far to cross. Yeah. As much as we'd love Ukraine to join NATO at this point, if you're sort of uh, pro Ukrainian or a fan of Ukraine um, or just feel sympathy for Ukraine, um, it's just not really going to happen. Um, and if it did, I think the consequences would probably be catastrophic. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe Biden should turn around and say, right, Putin, you've got 48 hours to get your people out and then NATO are rolling in. But I just don't see that's going to really cool things down. No. Um, and and the other thing with this war as well, it seems to be Putin's invested an awful lot of his credibility into this because when he first became president, he gave a speech about how he's always traditionally viewed the end of the Soviet Union as one of the greatest geopolitical disasters and he kind of pretty much vowed to, you know, to pursue rebuilding the Eastern Bloc. Right. And obviously involved Poland, Ukraine. And if you look at his behavior, you know, Georgia, Crimea and all that sort of stuff, it, it's it, there is definitely Putin's trying. And I think he maybe he was thinking about his legacy. Maybe he thought Ukraine would be easier, be a nice kind of cherry on the cake of Putin's legacy before he retired because he's getting on a bit. Now. Right. Um, and he doesn't. You know, I, I've always been cautious to talk about his health, but he certainly looks a bit puffier and different. And he doesn't look well. No, no, and that's probably stress more than anything. Yeah. But, but, um, and I, and I heard he became quite paranoid over COVID. Almost Howard, uh, is it Howard Hughes or Howard Hawks levels? I'm trying to remember which well, one. Howard Hughes was the guy who was holed up in Vegas. Yeah, that's it with the big beard yeah. and long fingernails yeah. or something. <laughs> <laughs> which in fact if you're a germaphobe you probably don't want long fingernails in the beard but but there you probably want to shave all your hair off but uh uh but there we go <laughs> so uh so that's that's nuclear threats but um one one so with my like fear of i don't know dying in a blinding nuclear flash as a bomb hits It'll be quick london it will be quick i'm hoping <laughs> i'm hoping to emulate what james bond did in no time to die or i could maybe yeah i don't know stand up and look at it maybe have a nice drink in my hand a martini <laughs> to finish off you know my my life yeah. and uh, yeah <laughs> ponder what happens next what's the next <laughs> chapter um and the future of this podcast as we blow up into a billion pieces um so <laughs> So there's this term which I, I just came across the other day called apocalypse hacking. And there was this article in CNET.com about these luxury nuclear bunkers, mainly for wealthy people, because these bunkers, uh, well, the bunker has is um, 16 stories underground and it has these condos within it and they range from $1.5 million to $3 million dollars. And they're quite, they're really nice, you know, like luxury apartments. They look amazing. I mean, God, I'd love to live in one of these things. And and if I had the money, it was probably stupid enough. Maybe I would buy one of these bunkers because, hey, if I could get to, I think it's in Colorado, wherever it is, if I get there in time before Putin's bombs come down, you know, then I feel like a winner. Within this bunker, you've got a cinema, library, shooting range, <laughs> uh, schools, you've got facilities to grow vegetables and farm fish, and you've got a video link to other bunkers owned by the same company. Company, so that's all quite nice um and the only thing is really you've got to get on with your neighbors um they also they kind of say that they can only really guarantee that you'll be okay for about five years their supplies pretty much only last that long and that's kind of being a bit optimistic because they also have this idea of they can grow fish and vegetables in that time too 
what happens if that doesn't work, you know? And if they don't do proper rationing and stuff like that. And the other thing in these condos, because uh, I've watched this video, um, was that they had gas ovens, which struck me as a bit dangerous. There's a fire risk there, because surely an electric oven would be safer than a gas one in a nuclear bunker. Gas runs out. Yeah, and gas runs out. So, I mean, I may be wrong, but when I looked at the stove as they were filming this thing, that to me looked like a gas stove. It really did not look like an electric yeah. one. So, unless there's some range of really cool electric uh, hobs that are actually styled like a gas one, a bit like you can get like typewriters for keyboards. Right, right, right. So, right. maybe there's some sort of retro thing. But to me, that, that instantly, like, mm, that's gas. That's not good. And, and people, especially after a nuclear apocalypse, you're going to be, you're not exactly going to be especially for the first few weeks as you cope with it, mentally, you're probably not going to be in the best place. And it's probably not a good idea to have gas and matches around. Nope. <laughs> because either nope. somebody might want to top themselves, or they might make a mistake or have an accident, or burn some chips in oil <laughs> and cause a massive fire. So uh, <laughs> that was my big, I thought it was the big fatal flaw, a bit like the Death Star with the little uh, <laughs> refueling thing. There's always some flaw in these things. But uh, that was <laughs> that would be my only complaint to the owner. Be like, I think you should rethink this gas thing. So I don't know if you had any thoughts about apocalypse hacking. And <laughs> this to me, I mean, good business model for the companies that's selling this yeah. stuff. But to me, it just oh, screams yeah. of rich people who have way too much money and just the hubris to yeah. think that they can survive anything. I think oh, yeah. in the actual event yeah. of an apocalypse, so whether that's brought on by Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or North Korea or COVID-23, whatever you want to call it. I don't think this is going to happen the way they think. Um, mm. You know, I, I, I just, it's, you, you hear a lot about, you know, really rich billionaire tech people, you know, getting these bulk holes in, you know, this South mm. Island of New Zealand, you know, which is probably one of the safer places to be in these kind of situations. But Oh, yeah, there's a Neville Duke book about that, I yeah, think, isn't yeah. there? Yeah, I think <laughs> about the nuclear cloud that slowly comes yeah. to us. <laughs> uh, but I don't know. It's just, it's just like, okay, if, if, if I'm a former, you know, SEAL or SAS bodyguard hired by some tech billionaire and the apocalypse comes and, you know, why, why would I, you know, what, what good is your money at that point? You know, yeah. okay, you were a billionaire. You're not now. The economy's gone. There's no stock market. There's no computer systems. There's no, mm. like, who are you? You know, yeah. and I'm the guy with the gun that's trained how to use it. You know, why am I going to work for you? And, and, and basically be your pet in this underground bunker for the next five plus years. You know, like it's, it, mm. it's not going to go the way they're, the way they think. Well, no, it would lead to some form of anarchy, and usually he who has the biggest gun wins in those scenarios. Exactly. Um, I'd much rather be the former <laughs> CEO SAS guy in that situation than the you know tech billionaire who thinks yeah. he's a master of the universe. Yeah, unfortunately, I've missed that boat now, being former CEO SAS. <laughs> Me too. I don't think I was ever destined for that <laughs> Me anyway. Too. Not happening. <laughs> oh, dear. Actually, the other thing as well. Like um, with the nuclear apocalypse, it would be quite quick because it's not like I think a lot of people assume it'd be like one country fires a missile to another. And I think, have you got how many minutes is it if you were to fire an ICBM from Moscow to DC? I don't know how long oh. that exactly takes. It's seven minutes or is it longer than that? I want to say around 20, but I'm not sure. I think it depends. I mean, I know like the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm. that was a huge deal because it was, it was mm. a lot shorter, yeah. you know? Yeah. Well, subs, nuclear right. subs. Russia have them. Yeah. They'll probably park them off the coast of New oh, York, yeah. just where they're in the dead spot. And that's the thing. Russia has a nuclear deterrent at sea, as do we. So even if you, like, I don't know, some mad general thought, hey, we could take out Russia. <laughs> the problem is, is the subs that are around after. Same with anybody who strikes Britain at the moment. Yeah. You know, we had these subs that will, will take you out after the fact, if necessary. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the deterrence theory for you. Mm, exactly. So... So let's hope it works, that theory, um, and keeps people from pressing the button. So we will now move into uh, spy entertainment, and we have the 60th anniversary of the world's most famous spy, James Bond, who seems to be known in every bar across the world, and people seem to know what his favourite drink is. <laughs> so um, I'm actually going to a Bond event tomorrow at the British Film Institute, where I'll be uh, watching a talk with Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson. Nice. And in fact, when I was 20... 
was I 22? I met Michael G. Wilson at a screening for a Wim Wenders film, and Barbara Broccoli was in the background, and I asked him this very nerdy question about whether the plot of The Living Daylights was inspired by the Year of Spies, 1985, and all these defectors, and, and he sort of politely said no, and Barbara was sort of laughing in the background <laughs> at this nerdy question from this 22-year-old, and that was it. So I, I doubt if I went up to Michael G. Wilson tomorrow and said, hey, Michael, I doubt he will remember me, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, so Matt, what are your thoughts? Do you have any memories of Bond or any thoughts you have over its, his 60-year reign as the world's most famous spy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up with 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 James Bond, you know, the the Pierce Brosnan films in the 90s. I think the mm-hmm. first Bond yeah. movie that I saw in theaters was uh, The World's Not Enough in 2000. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I just remember as a kid, you know, like going to like video rental stores when those were still a thing mm. and just getting a bunch of the, uh, yeah, the Roger Moore, the Sean Connery Bonds. And I mean, just consuming them all. I mean, had a huge was a huge foundational experience for me, you know, as a, as a storyteller is just, you know, the interest in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Very excited to see where, where the franchise goes, goes from here. You know, I think there's a lot of, Mm. uh, I mean, I think the internet has chosen that they want Idris Elba as the next Bond. I, I've said many times that's not going to happen. You know, I'm sure Idris Elba would do fine, but, uh, I think a, he's too old. I, I think, yeah, I I often get texts from people about you know who is the mm. next Bond going to be. And you look at people like you know Henry Cavill or Tom Hardy or someone, mm. and you know they mm. they all sort of fit the bill. They would be great, but I think when they choose who the next Bond is going to be, it's going to be someone that we don't really know. And there he's not going to be a household name. Well, this is it. Like Daniel Craig, yeah. look at Daniel Craig. He was a very exactly. um, good kind of bit part actor. Yeah. Um, he'd been in a few independent films. He was a great actor, but not particularly famous. See that shot of him in Layer Cake with the gun, where he's like sort yeah, of like yeah, yeah like yeah, meant to be. That's it. That was actually the film that got him the job. Apparently, that's where right, they, right. Um, and it was between him and Henry Cavill. Apparently, Martin Campbell wanted um, uh, Henry Cavill because he was a bit younger, and the producers wanted Daniel Craig, and they went with Daniel Craig. Um, but it, Henry Cavill's too famous, I think, uh, as is, and it, um, both Idris and Tom Hardy are now too yep. old and too famous. Yep. And so Idris had had this been like 15 years ago, maybe, especially after the war. Sure. And I would personally, I would prefer Cheetle Ijafor if you're going for a black okay. bond. I think he's much smoother and kind of more bondish than Idris yeah. Elba. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one. Who is the next bond? So my, my, <laughs> I honestly, I have no idea. The person who struck me the other day, I was watching um, Bullet Train, which is not the world's greatest movie but it wasn't terrible either and it had aaron taylor is aaron taylor aaron taylor Um, johnson that's aaron taylor johnson and suddenly in that film because i've never i've always been a bit like i i don't know he's not an actor i think is amazing but i watched that film i thought actually do you know what he sort of fits the profile he's got the swagger and that smooth i think he could do it i think he would be a very good james bond but whether he will be is a whole other matter he could again he's someone i think he's someone that Mm. that 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 fits the bill but i i think it's i mean Mm. he's been in a couple marvel movies and stuff now too you know i i really think it's yeah but not as a major no yeah right 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 i mean it's it's uh i i think it's going to be uh whoever they pick is going to be a surprise and you know like this 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 article it's in variety that we're talking about here um uh, it's they're talking about it's interviewing Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson, you know, mm. the the producers of the of the franchise, and they're talking about how uh, when they pick a new Bond, it's not just it's not just the face, it's it's mm. how do they match with this iteration of Bond that they want to go through for the next you know ten fifteen years or something. You know, you look mm. at what Daniel Craig mm. went through. Um, mm. I mean, totally, it's he's he's forever carrying that mm. that role you know well this is it every bond like more was the humoristic one right. um timothy dalton who was my favorite is the more intense one um and then pierce brosnan was kind of match of connery and more and then you know daniel craig is a bit more in that kind of timothy dalton brutish. kind of intense yeah. yeah yeah brutish a bit um I, the thing i always missed actually i miss bond the connoisseur bond who knew, who would have conversations about like what vintage of brandy or yeah. wine, something <laughs> so that would also become like a major plot well point that's sort of true to fleming isn't it yeah yeah 
It is. Yeah, like um, in From Russia With Love, James Bond realises the British agent's not British because he's having red wine with fish. I mean, how dare he? Yeah. <laughs> and it's that that kind of um, gives Bond the edge. I just I miss those kind of details yeah. that were very Fleming-like. Um, so, yeah, so what are they going to do? Because obviously after the Pierce Brosnan era, so it ended with Die Another Day, and it was a very, to me, that film was very bloated and very comical. Not the best. And just a bit, not the best. No, it was just a bit silly. Yeah. And um and and I just don't see the the because the producers then went to Casino Royale, and I just I'd be very I, it's going to be hard to figure out where they want to go next because I just don't think they're going to want to go in a Pierce Brosnan direction, but whether they can find this sort of nice medium ground between sort of intense and a bit more because I think with the it's funny I've been rewatching the Bond films in the cinema over the last few months um and. I went to see Tomorrow Never Dies and um, I went with some Bond fans and my God, Tomorrow Never Dies was a really you know, fun film to watch. It has its problems. I think it gets into very generic 90s action film towards the end. There's like zero tactics going on when Bond does the assault. Those Brosnan movies are like a time capsule. They are. They yeah. are. And Goldeneye. Yes. I, Goldeneye was my first Bond film in the cinema. Uh, seeing Bond jump off this dam and all that was amazing on the big screen because I was the of the VHS era like yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I watched all my Bond films either on television or videotape, going to my local video store. Uh, also, the, it's the smell on the... It's the smell of the carpet at the video store and the sound <laughs> of the dot matrix printer that instantly just takes me back to being a kid, seeing these Bond films in there. They had these black covers with the Warner Brothers logo on them because Warner Brothers was the distributor of Bond films in the 80s uh, in the UK. And honestly, that's very nostalgic, that kind of stuff. So it's like, so yeah. So who knows? I don't know what the future is, but I think um, one thing I learned from the Tomorrow Never Dies screening and chatting with Bond fans all that afterwards, just it was a bit more, Bond was on a mission and he just got on with the job, which has been a bit missing in the Daniel Craig era. It's yes. got a bit, um, it's got very introspective. I feel like the films are sort of borderline getting a little bit pretentious in places where they're trying to turn it into an Oscar winning drama and Bond just isn't that. I think Bond can have elements of that i think that's where for me license to kill kind of works because it's this sort of more intense story but it's still kind of a classic bond film and it still has these crazy moments like you know he suddenly harpoons a plane and jet skis behind it or or like the amazing tanker chase and license to kill um you know those bond moments and I, and I think that's sort of what's been a little bit missing in the daniel craig era post um casino royale really <laughs> yeah i mean i think to to your to mm. your point about them trying to make yeah. Bond films, this is big Oscar winning drama. I think they accidentally were victims of their own success with Skyfall. And I know Skyfall is not 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 your favorite. I, I I enjoyed it, but I mean, I think that movie did way better. I mean, financially and and the way it was critically received, did way better than I think they expected. Um, and that they got, they got, they got close to that Oscar, you know, I mean, was it, was it going to be best picture? But I mean, that was critically received the best Bond film in, in, in memory. Um, and then I think they tried to, through Spectre and then No Time to Die, tried to, tried to recreate that. And they got a bit ahead of their skis mm. a bit. I mean, I, I enjoyed No Time to yeah. Die a lot. Mm, um, I did. Spectre mm. and not my favorite of the craig run um i i honestly think i think blowfeld was kind of wasted i think they kind of wasted that mm -hmm. opportunity to bring back blowfeld mm -hmm. i mean i thought the casting was fantastic yeah. um yeah, but they just did nothing with it especially considering the whole lawsuit and how many years yeah. it took him to get that character right. back and then suddenly pff, it just fizzled yeah. i mean do you have a do you want to do a top five in reverse of your craig era film sure so number five <laughs> i was thinking about this all morning okay so yeah uh, starting least favorite, Quantum of Solace, Victim of the Writer's Strike. But, you know, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, Spectre, number four. Yeah. Third is Skyfall. Second, yeah. No Time to Die. And yeah. then most favorite is Casino Royale. That script is fantastic. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. We're similar and very different. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, what, are, what are yours? So my number five was Spectre. Okay. Number four was Skyfall, and this is all from doing a recent rewatch. Um, the number three actually was Quantum of Solace. Uh, with that one, I love the energy and tone of that film. 
and the style of I thought Daniel Craig looks amazing. I thought the styling of the film was pretty cool, especially that kind of weird had this sort of weird sort of modern sixties thing going on. Um how M's office upgraded to something from Star Trek for the next generation, I never quite figured out. But <laughs> there you go. I miss M's office because the aesthetic of M's office was consistent from the Pierce Brosnan era up till Casino yes. Royale. It was always this sort of wooden paneled room. Um I, I you know, not the, the dark wooden panel room, but the kind of more modern looking and I and I miss that aesthetic. But anyway, um, number two, No Time to Die. I thought honestly that was the second best Daniel Craig movie. It has its problems, but I Bond finally saves the world, and it's from these nasty nanobots. Yep. Um, and I still have a debate about whether they made it nanobots in in post or not, because the styling of the nanobot technology did look very organic in the uh, in, in the layer. But that, but then at the same oh, time, it's going to look visually interesting. They from a film. rewrote it from COVID. Well, yeah, from a kind of COVID sensitivity. Okay, okay, I've never thought of that before yeah i've rewatched the film a few times with that in mind and i and honestly it would have required a reshoot which yes i'm not aware that happened so i don't know that i, I think it always was nanobots but i could be wrong okay there's a nice little fun theory to play around with, and i know that a lot of bond fans are still debating this and hating on that uh. film um because of the ending um and in fact i think that ending as controversial as it was has kind of made the future bond films more interesting because now there's always a question will he die in this one Will he survive? I loved yeah. it. I, I, I mean, this might be a hot take for me. I absolutely love that ending. It was so it was bold. It was moving to your point. It was a good ending and a send off for that character. I mean, I, from a storytelling standpoint, I don't like stories that just go on and on and on and on and on. That you take this character and you put him in a new story and okay, and he wins and then it goes to the next one. You know, you have an arc, you have a beginning, a middle and an end. And they told that with the yeah. Craig Bonds. And I'd love to see that. I was shocked that they mm. killed him. Yeah, uh, somebody. It's the problem about when you know people. Somebody, I, uh, a Bond person who's quite connected, I was chatting with, and he's being a bit cryptic because we were talking about like, what would Bond film would you like to make? And I was like, and I had one about um, where it was ambiguous about whether Bond lived or not. I thought that'd be a great way to kind of send off a character as you leave it ambiguous. Now we've. No time to die. It doesn't seem ambiguous. To He's me. quite dead, <laughs> unless somehow he is the opening shot. Of the next film's in the water, yeah. and somehow the bomb blew him off the thing. But anyway, and somehow killed the nanobots. But um, <laughs> I, um, but there we go. But yeah, so I, I had hints of that might be the ending. And so when it was the bit where you know when they redesignate him 007 in the plane, yes. That was like a war movie. And I was like, ah, oh, he's going to die, isn't he? He's going to yeah. die. I can yeah, see that Yeah, good now. catch. That good was catch. the bit where I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so number one, Casino Royale. Yep. Um, love it, love it, love it. Um, and I was in Venice just recently, and I managed to find a few of the locations from the film, and it's just such fun I, it's, yeah, that film is just... Um, there's so many people I know who don't like Bond films but love that film. It just worked. I think it's interesting how Skyfall was the most... I think Skyfall and Spectre are probably the most successful Bond films. I think Spectre might actually, from a financial point of view, be more successful than Skyfall. I believe they both, um, they both got over it, a billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Spectre to me is just derivative and boring. And, and just, the, the for me, the bits I enjoy with Spectre were... Um, M had that line about, so that's what C stands for. Mm. Careless. And he obviously didn't mean careless, but um, his word was too rude for us to say on this podcast. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, actually, no, we can, but I won't. Um, you know, I, I, that line was brilliant, but I just, yeah, that film, uh, Spectre just pff, was a mess. But Casino Royale obviously comes from Fleming. I remember when I first heard about they were going to make Casino Royale, I went and bought the book and read it the year before. Um, and it's amazing kind of how much of it they captured and brought into the new movie and obviously all the extra elements they added because I was thinking, God, how do you make this a movie? Because because the book itself, um, it just starts pretty much at that casino. Um, I think the opening line is something about the smell of a casino at three in the morning. And yeah, just those Fleming touches. I think Bond has always been strongest when it's very close to Fleming. And that's why I've always liked License to Kill because even though License to Kill was not uh, based on a Fleming book, the writers worked very hard to be very Flemingish, and they were basing it on like a very real thing at this time, which was the drug baron Sanchez yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And in the late eighties and early nineties, 
you know, drugs and the American war and drugs and Miami Vice and that sort of stuff with the the talk of the town. And and so Sanchez always felt very real. And to me, he's still my favourite villain and Le Chief would be number two. Um, I just find them both very... There's a lot of energy behind those two actors and um, Robert Darby, good actor. I'm not sure he's a great person, I don't know. But, <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> sorry, Robert. I've never met him. So I hear he's amazing to hang out with but it's just when you start getting into politics you want to run out the door um but he's brilliant i still think sanchez is still my favorite bond villain yeah. um sorry it's about yeah. bond villains but um yeah it's just because you know i own license to kill have a nice energy about them that i always liked um and i just sadly don't think they ever quite got um the promise of this new stripped back bond just sort of fell apart after quantum of solace that's why I like Quantum of Solace as well, is that tone and energy it was sort of cashing in on that promise of this stripped back bond. And then obviously with Skyfall, they went back to more familiar ground, bring back Q yep. and M. But with Skyfall, they were a bit reliant on a bit of irony. Oh, we don't do exploding pens anymore. And then Inspector, they run out of irony by this point. They yeah. just needed things to blow up. And, and the watch, the old habits die hard. Yeah. And, and like the whole thing, Inspector, when he's in that chair being drilled in the eye and his watch, it's just such a weird scene. It's like, what are they doing? And how does James Bond not go blind after being stabbed in the eye? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I know there's this whole alternative theory that beyond that moment, he's all in this weird, because his head got drilled, he's in some weird coma and everything else is a fantasy. Uh, Very dark interpretation. Yeah, that's, that, a bit, but, that's a bit too, that's a bit too <laughs> avant-garde for Bond, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But uh, um, but maybe that's the plot of the next maybe, movie. Wakes up, maybe it's coma and no time to die never happened, <laughs> and you know, and Blofeld's still out there somewhere. And and because there was this talk the other day of Leah Sadu might come back for a third movie. Please don't. I, I I think you're great in the first two. I just don't see how you fit into the next. One. I think you need a, with the whatever happens next bomb. It needs to be a clean sweep. I think. Yeah. I mean, you could probably keep M and Q and Money Penny, maybe. Um, but I just think they should, uh, yeah, just start again from scratch and see what happens. To your point of starting over again from scratch, I think something that made Casino Royale so effective was, I mean, if you if mm. you want to look for an example of how you reboot a franchise that's gone a bit stale, you need to reboot it yeah. for a new age. I mean, that's a perfect example. It, it, they've sort of had, mm. they've had this issue twice. I mean, mm. at the end of the Dalton run, you know, right at the end of the Cold War, there's a lot of talk, well, is Bond relevant, you know? going into this, you know, going into the 90s, like, haha, this swagger, we won, mm, you know, it's mm, the end of history. Mm. How do you have yeah. that character exist in this world? And they managed to do that in a sense with with uh, Brosnan. And, you know, they definitely did that again going into the, you know, post 9-11 world that came so soon after. Yeah. So how they now do this for a third time, um, I don't, I don't envy the broccoli's Fun mm. fact: Did you know? Did did sorry, did, did you know that uh, the vegetable broccoli is named after their family, not the other way around? Is it? Yes. Wow, I had yeah. no idea. Whatever, like historical family they're from in Italy. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but yeah, yeah. that the vegetable is named for the family. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic where did you learn that that's brilliant i love it i saw it on i saw it on, i think i saw it on twitter the other day yeah, i'll have to yeah. flag it for you but yeah. yeah oh that's fantastic oh because yeah there's always been sort of uh people have sort of joked a bit about their name sometimes being the other way around but uh no, no. <laughs> oh dear is there anything else you want to say about bond because it's just a couple other spy entertainment things i'm just going to quickly throw in before we wrap up but uh no i got nothing on bond good luck to the next one well in the uk on monday itv have a new five-part drama called the walk-in which looks at a far-right plot to murder a british mp and it's based on true story and it centers around a anti-fascist organization called hope not hate who have an informant in the far-right organization of plotting this attack and so i think to us viewers that might come out i don't know when that i don't know how itv shows come to america as they end up on netflix or they end up on PBS because I see uh, where did Downton Abbey end up in America? Was that PBS or? Oh, uh, that was on PBS, yeah. Yeah, so it probably end up on PBS. But um, if you have a VPN, uh, is it Nord VPN? Who are not a sponsor, but maybe they might be one day. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Nord VPN is a great way to probably be able to watch this ITV drama because once they've broadcast it, it ends up on your ITV website for free. So it's well worth probably a nine ninety nine Nord subscription for one month. It's a five part drama with Stephen Graham, and it's based on a true story. And funnily enough, I. 
I am planning to chat with Hope Not Hate about this in the next sort of few weeks. And there might be a follow-up podcast nice. soon about that real-life story. Because we had the murder of Joe Cox in the UK um, a few years ago. And there's even been a second MP who, who was a Conservative MP who, unfortunately, his name totally escapes me at this point. South End. So I don't mean disrespect. But yeah, yeah, we've had two murdered MPs and, and nearly a third, you know. And it's, um, it is quite worrying. Um and people just start killing people they disagree with. So, I don't know, try not to resolve your issues with a gun or a knife, please. <laughs> use a tactical <laughs> nuclear Especially weapon empty. instead. Yeah, use a tactical nuclear weapon. It's a lot cleaner. You lose all the <laughs> DNA evidence. You get away with it, you know. <laughs> Um, we've also got Jack Ryan returning in December. What did you did you watch the Jack Ryan show? Because I know you were a Tom Clancy I, fan. I yeah, am too. Yeah, I watched the first season when it aired mm. and discussed it on uh, another podcast. Um, I did not oh. watch the second or or this other season. Um, I heard not the best things about the second season, so I haven't I haven't gotten around to it. But if I hear that this third one is is fantastic from people whose opinions I trust mm. and value, I will I will mm. check it out. Mm. I think the problem with that show for me, it just, yeah, it, I love, like, I love The Hunt for October. I yeah. love Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger. I actually quite like the Ben Affleck one. Um, Some of our fears. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. And especially at the moment of all that's going on, it's like, <laughs> if you watch that, it's like, oh my God, yeah. this is getting really meta. But um, the, so the Chris Pine one was a, was just, not very good and it's sort of like and i think it's the problem when you turn jack ryan into an operator it starts to go a bit it goes just off the point exactly. he's always supposed to be a bit of a fish out of water he wasn't a man of action he's more a man of intellect he's quite a he's a he's a yuppie college professor yeah you know yeah. he's an he's an he's he's an analyst which is which is what sort of makes those situations work when clancy would mm. would when Clancy would put him in a situation where he's being shot at, he's like, I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. You know, Clear present danger that that sequence yes. where they're getting attacked in the convoy is brilliant because there's many opportunities where he could have picked up a gun, but he didn't. Yeah. And at the ending of that film, too. And he and Jack Ryan, you know, uses um, what's his name? John. John oh, Clark. The, John Clark, that's it. He's his man of action. So he's yeah. like, you know, that's what espionage is about. You generally have an officer who relies on somebody else to do the dirty work. Right. You know, that's what I like about Spy Game as well. Um, and so when they make him the operator, it just goes downhill. And I, and like, I don't think it was the right showrunner for that show either. I just think you need a showrunner who, who um, kind of cares a bit about espionage i think yeah. in my opinion because i think what happens is it just becomes generic yeah yeah and that's what happened to jack ryan it felt very generic absolutely i th i think it's it's i think those i mean like you know tom colgan some other producer mm. if you're listening call me but i think those yes, and me <laughs> those yes and chris too <laughs> i think those adaptations a clancy adaptation can work i think it's it's mm. a format if you look at the books like the 90s, late 80s books where this all begins, it's it's ripe for a prestige TV adaptation that's handled seriously and with good dramatic mm. heft, like mm. an HBO uh, succession, mm. you know, uh, uh, in, in, in that kind of a way that is faithful to the time period and the characters and that setting can work really mm. well. But to your point, when you turn into something that's not, because he's Jack Ryan is not Jason Bourne, he's not... You know, uh, he's not James Bond. You know, mm. he's not one of these other myriad of thriller characters that have proliferated yeah. in the past, you know, decade or two. Yeah. You know, take him for what he is and 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 own that and adapt it from that standpoint. And I think you'd yeah. be surprised at what you get. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And it was a missed opportunity, I think. So, uh, yeah. Now, uh, last one. Did you ever, do you see The Old Man with Jeff Bridges? No, wait, no. I'm thinking True no. Grit for a second, but no, I do not. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, so he plays a kind of retired sort of assassin. So he's more of an operator. So okay. it does, is reliant on action. I saw the first episode last night. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, it had a fight scene that went on maybe two minutes longer than I would have liked it to go on. <laughs> It's like, I remember Atomic Blonde. I just got bored after about two or three minutes into that long fight scene. And, and, 
What was that film? Mad Max. Oh, God. I did not enjoy Mad Max, Mad Fury Road, whatever it's no? called. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road. No. I, I, um, That's a hot take. I got bored. Yeah. I got bored. I don't know. Maybe I've just got to this point where I prefer people talking. Yeah. <laughs> I lot don't of, know. A lot, lot of chaos in that movie. A lot of just, just, just balls to the wall. Yeah. Yeah. It was beautifully filmed and executed. I, yeah. From a technical point of view, they were doing things I have no idea quite how to do it. I applaud them. But... I just, it was lacking, for me, it was lacking kind of character and story and development and stuff. I just, I don't know, it was just this big action scene that kind of, when I was, I was thinking, when I was a kid, it was like, I remember um, you go to fireworks displays and then the, the fireworks display would end after 10 minutes. You'd be so disappointed. And then I went and saw Mad Max and realized why you end your fireworks display after 10 minutes. It's hard to sustain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's kind of my feeling, but yeah, that's a but, that's a uh, really good yeah. point. That's a really good point. Yeah, I just got desensitized. So, uh, but there we go. Yeah. Well, look, Matt, I think we probably should wrap up in a moment. And thank you, everybody. If anybody is still listening, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. But uh, is there any, anything else you'd like to add before we do finish today? Uh, no, I think this was this was a great chat. I'm excited to do more of these. Yeah, um, and I hope. Too. Yeah, if you're listening and still doing dishes or laundry or driving or whatever, I hope you're not. <laughs> yeah, falling asleep at the wheel. Listen to us yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't want that yeah. <laughs> well matt thank you for joining me it's been i've really enjoyed this chat thank and you thank you everybody who's listening and we will we will be with you again on the first saturday of november i guess now yeah because we're going to be out on the first Saturday of October. So yeah. it'll be nice and autumnal. Uh, all the coloured leaves will be slowly falling by the next time you hear our voices. So. <laughs> but there we go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.